you're probably making these big mistakes in Defender Antivirus and it's creating gaps in your protection. Through hundreds of security assessments that we've done as Microsoft Ireland Security Partner of the Year, we encounter lots of mistakes folks make with Defender Antivirus. And so in this video, we're going to cover five misconfigurations that you want to avoid and also strategies to consider with Defender Antivirus. All right, so we're going to start in the Intune Admin Center. We could use group policy for this, but Intune Admin Center is probably the most common one. And we're going to talk about mistake number one, and that is not properly using and understanding block at first sight and the different cloud block levels. I'll head into endpoint security, then antivirus, and this is where most folks will configure their antivirus policies. I've got an existing one that I'm going to edit to talk you through this, and we'll go into the configuration settings. Now, block at first sight is really a combination of policies. And to explain what it does, I'm going to go down to them. Here we go. So you'll see here we've got a cloud block level, and we've got a cloud extended timeout. Now, block at first sight, if I run executables that the local levels of machine learning and definitions and things don't particularly trust, and typically that's because there's, you know, the hash has never been seen before in the wild based on Microsoft telemetry. As that executable gets clicked on, we're going to hit the pause button on it. We're then going to send data of that executable to the cloud, make a determination there based on things that we can't actually determine on the device itself, and then send that determination back down. So you can think of it as saying, you know what, that file you just launched, we're going to suppress it. We're going to block it at first sight until the cloud and all the systems that go on up there and Microsoft's protection services, we deem it's appropriate to run. And we control that through some of the settings here. First off, the cloud extended timeout. That determines how long we can hit that pause button for. There's a built-in value of 10 seconds, and you can add in up to 50 seconds to get it closer to a minute. The cloud block level, you can uh, roughly translate this to that dial of aggressive versus less aggressive, of my tolerance for false positives, my requirement for it to be known good versus accepting a little bit of risk. That's what this cloud block level does. So for example, we really want to choose high as a minimum, in my opinion. High plus makes it a little bit more aggressive, but maybe more prone to false positives. And zero tolerance, that basically says, unless Microsoft have explicitly determined that this file is trustworthy, don't allow it to execute. And one good strategy for these is to think of having different policies for different types of devices. Maybe your domain controllers, you should be a little bit more aggressive in protecting than uh, normal production endpoints. So those are two of the settings, cloud block level and cloud extended timeout. The other setting, and I'm going to try and find it in this huge list here. Well, number one, I need to allow cloud protection to begin with. It's on by default, so I haven't really mentioned it, but I'll call it out now that I'm here. And tell you what, I'm going to use control F to search for this. If I search for sample, hopefully I can find it. Here we go, or submit samples consent. This basically determines samples that run on my endpoint. Can they be sent to Microsoft's cloud data set? For analysis. The default is it can send what it calls safe samples. So basically things that aren't documents. In most cases, you're going to want to lean towards sending all samples automatically, but maybe you're in a high regulated environment. You got some, you know, different levels of risk tolerance with data security. You could consider sending safe samples automatically. So those are the policies that we all need to configure to combined make up block at first sight. And that's our first thing that we see a lot of folks missing out on. We want to make sure that that is explicitly enabled in policy. Next up, we're going to talk about exclusions. And this is going to be mistake number two that we want to avoid. And that is not making your exclusions in Defender Antivirus as narrow and tight as possible. I'm going to go down to exclusions within this same policy. And, you know, it's fairly common, unfortunately, that sometimes I'll be performing a security assessment and I will see something like excluded paths, C colon backslash, and then in its worst case, just the full drive. But maybe in some other cases, it's a little bit more specific and it says a path to a specific folder. One of the things that we can do with Defender Antivirus is something called contextual exclusions. And this is where maybe if you've hit performance issues, we can say exclude a specific process or path, but only under specific conditions. So for example, let's head to excluded processes. We're going to hit add here and I'm going to try and copy something over from my clipboard. We'll see if this works. Here we go. So this is what a contextual exclusion might look like. And you'll see here, we're saying, okay, Word files, fundamentally, we can exclude those and we can use wildcards to narrow down the specific type of path we might want to allow, but actually only allow it when this process 
interacts with a word file. So quite a common thing you'll see is, you know, one of my apps, as soon as it touches a different file, Defensor Antivirus just goes crazy and it causes performance issues. This narrows the scope of those exclusions down. So I'm not always excluding this full process. I'm not always excluding all my doc files. I'm excluding the combination of those things. And that really just tunes and, and hones down and keeps your exclusions nice and tight so there's less room for exploit. Now, the third mistake that we're going to talk about that we see a lot of folks making with Defender Antivirus is if you're moving to Defender Antivirus from a different platform, it's quite easy to then just go away and ignore the Windows Firewall. I'm going to jump out of this profile and look, I, uh, I appreciate that technically Windows Firewall isn't part of Defender Antivirus, but they, they make up the same endpoint protection story. Defender built-in firewall on Windows 10 and 11 is actually quite good out the box. Right? Got a lot of reasonable policies such as the automatic blocking of inbound activity. But where I'd maybe say the mistake that folks are making is not then going away and hardening it even further. One example of that, and I'm just going to create a policy just to show you the type of thing that you might want to consider is I'll head into Windows Firewall. Let me just call this test. And again, this is going to be a huge list of things. I'm going to try and be smart about it and use Control F to help me quickly navigate to them. I think because I'm in Zoom mode quite a lot here, it makes it hard for me to see that. Yeah, I tell you what, we're in the wrong policy type. We're going to go back here. We're going to go Windows and we're going to go into Firewall Rules and that's not going to work either. So I'm going to go back here. We'll call that test. And first off in our policy, we need to enable it for all these different networks. This would be enabled by default on the endpoint, but the policy we need to configure it. So for each of these types of networks, you would want to do what I'm about to show you, but we're going to say true. And these are the policies that I want you to start thinking about. It's called allow local policy merge. A lot of times you'll find when a user installs an application, maybe that's just pushed down through your endpoint management platform, or maybe the users get local admin rights and they can install apps themselves. That app will add firewall exclusions on the user's behalf. Some of those are questionable. If the user's got local admin rights, they could go in and create their own rules. Might not be things that you want as a sysadmin or a security engineer or a security architect. So for example, if we go in here and we say false and do not allow local policy merge, that requires us, requires the endpoint to centrally manage our client firewall rules. All of a sudden that's great because it just stops, maybe not the most advanced someone or someone that's really persistent trying to bypass your things because if they've got local admin, that's never good anyway. But it stops that, you know, application potentially going away and conf configuring these rules on the user's behalf. Like I said, though, it does require you to centrally manage policy. So you get that security benefit of being in control of your endpoint firewall rules. Reality is that's going to come at the expense of you having to spend a little bit more time into managing it and centralizing it. Fourth mistake that we're going to cover in this video is actually, if you've got that E5 license, it's leveraging something else in that to complement Defender Antivirus. For that, we're going to head over to Microsoft Defender, security.microsoft.com. Defender XDR security portal. It's got 100 names. We can use whatever. And for this mistake, we're talking about not leveraging Defender Vulnerability Management as a way of tracking misconfiguration and health errors in Defender. So I'm in this portal. I'm going to go Vulnerability Management going to go into recommendations and what we'll see is if I have onboarded into Defender for Endpoint or maybe just Defender Vulnerability Management if I've only got that license, it takes that data about what is the endpoint configured like and it says, hey, you have health errors on it. So for example, we can see here that we've got impaired communications for some of our devices with the Defender for Endpoint server. Things like these, they are surfaced in advanced hunting if you're at that level and you want to work with it and build custom detections. But the point being, use the license that's available to you to help stay on top, right? Don't just push out Defender Antivirus, Defender for Endpoint, and think, hey, that's job done. You can use Defender Vulnerability Management to get quite a nice low level of skill, I'd say, list of security recommendations to help understand, has this thing rolled out properly? And is it doing the things I want it to do? The final mistake that we're going to cover. So mistake number five is not considering a full and a well-architected strategy for managing updates. This one is quite topical because of obvious reasons in the news recently with regards to endpoint protection and EDR platform updates. We're going to talk about how we can control for that in Defender Antivirus. For that, again, I'm going to go to Intune and I'm going to create a policy, call it Windows, and I'm going to forgo this one here called Defender Updates, but I'm going to choose 
Microsoft Defender antivirus test. And I'm going to look at all these things that are to do with updates. I'll tell you what, Raz, I'm just pausing because I'm going to record this mistake number five again because I got a better way of introducing it. Cool, so I'm going to run with that one again. I'll give myself a minute. The final mistake that we're going to cover is lack of a well-architected update strategy. Now, with recent events in the antivirus and EDR world, there's a heightened awareness around this type of thing. Defender Antivirus has three main types of update. Security Intelligence Updates, or SIUs, Engine Updates, and Platform Updates. SIUs, they happen multiple times a day. They're to do with dealing with new threats. And Engine and Platform are more like monthly. Now, for each of these, we get different update channels. Kind of like how with Windows Update, I can get different channels, like Preview and Broad. I can do the same with Defender Antivirus. Before we get into the Intune Admin Center and run through it, what I'd recommend is understand your endpoints in scope. Have different profiles for updates for each of these. So for example, critical devices, let's say airport check-in systems for no particular reason, maybe have them on a critical time delay channel. Or if you're a test environment, maybe consider the preview and beta channels for that. Point being, know your estate and control defender updates and rings. Let's look at how we can actually do that. I'm going to go to my antivirus policies. I'll create one. And again, as I create this, Keep in mind that we can have different policies for different types of devices. I'm going to get a huge list of different settings in Defender again. I'm going to scroll all the way down and it will be buried down here somewhere. Or maybe I need to go up. Do control F to try and find that. Here we go. Here are updates. So you'll see I've got platform updates, engine updates, and security intelligence updates. My security intelligence updates, I get fewer channels for those. Um, so for example, the staged and the broad channel, I only get those options for those constant updates that happen throughout the day. But for example, for platform updates, which are really more based around feature changes and things like that, I get far more options. So for example, if I have devices that are so critical that I maybe need to accept that risk that they will get their updates a little bit less frequently, for those I could use the critical time delay channel. And I could structure this in a way where I have different policies for different types of devices. So those airport kiosk devices I mentioned, well, maybe I'm okay with a critical time delay for those, but maybe my standard user computers or something like that, well, you know what? Maybe for those, we'll just go with the stage channel. And we're again, just trying to balance those different risks. It's the risk of not being updated fast enough versus the risk of a potentially bad update. A couple of final things I'll just call out when we're talking about updates. First off, in terms of the frequency, in most cases, I like to update or at least check for an update every hour. You can customize that in this profile. Not all the time. It's not one size fits all. There's some nuance there, but that's my general preference because it keeps the update sizes smaller because it does it based on the delta. And then the other thing that you may want to consider is having backup and update channels. So for example, we'll try and find it here, but we can see here a setting called the signature update fallback order. We can maybe go to Microsoft update first, but then if that fails, let's revert to an on-prem update repository. So those are the different strategies for managing Microsoft Defender updates. Now, if you've got Microsoft 365, E3 or E5, Defender Antivirus is just one part of your security problems. If you want to find out five more mistakes that folks make with conditional access, you can watch this video.